Hello, B World. I am coming to you today to talk about Chapter 9 and the Traditions and Encounters. Um, you might wonder why I have a picture of someone uh, playing chess or two people playing chess here. On the right, we have a Muslim man. On the left, we have a Christian man playing. And the history of chess is really interesting. It probably was uh, first started in India and then it moved into Persia and then it became uh, popular with the Europeans. And of course, now we know it is a worldwide um, game that tests one's uh, strategy. And in fact, there are reports that sometimes people used uh, chess matches to decide a battle instead of actually putting their men in harm's way. So today we're going to be looking at, uh, as I said, chapter nine, cross-cultural connections at the end of the post-classical period, which brings us to about 1200 to 1300 CE, and then up to and including the bubonic plague. Uh, there are a few travelers that are mentioned at the very beginning of your text. Um, they are Marco Polo and Ibn Battuta. Uh, Marco Polo was a Venetian merchant. He was Christian. He actually traveled with his uncle and his father, and the goal was to get to the east, where he ended up serving in Kublai Khan's court. As you might recall, Kublai Khan was Mongolian, and he actually had replaced all of the Chinese bureaucracy and uh, preferred actually to get advice from people outside of China. Um, so uh, Marco Polo um, served in Kublai Khan's court for 17 years before returning and actually going to prison. Um, his travel journals inspired others to travel to China and actually have given us a lot of information about the time period that Kublai Khan was in charge of uh, the Yuan dynasty. Ibn Battuta is another scholar who was a Qadi. That means he was a he was an interpreter of the um, Islamic law. He extensively traveled from the Arabian Peninsula into um, Africa, especially to West Africa. And oftentimes um, he would hear cases according to Sharia law. And he was um, sometimes shocked at the lack of modesty of the women in, in um, Africa, in West Africa in particular, because uh, they did not wear the same kind of clothing that people in the Arabian Peninsula did. And part of the reason for that was just cultural and part of it was the weather. Nevertheless, his uh, journals and travels also tells a lot of what we um, need to know about, or what we do know rather about West Africa. Um, so what comes out of these um, exchanges? Well, you can see, first of all, the travels of Marco Polo st starting out in Venice and into uh, heading into Asia. We can also see here the travels of Ibn Battuta. Both of these men, I think, would be very difficult to know a lot about what we do know um, without the records that they have passed on to us. So our long distance trade, first of all, the Silk Roads provided um, overland trade routes. And of course, we know these go way back to Roman times, and they virtually linked all of Eurasia and Africa in the process. The Silk Roads, because they were overland, they used things like camels, horses, donkeys, other pack animals, and they could carry lighter things like silk, some porcelain, and gun powder. The caravansary were places where the caravans would stay and they would get refueled and they would get the, uh, the opportunity to talk to people from other parts of the world and spread ideas like Buddhism from South Asia to Southeast Asia. They would spread ideas such as Neo-Confucianism from China to Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. And then Islam would travel from Southwest Asia to India, as we've talked about before. Additionally, the Indian Ocean trade, of course, linking with the Mediterranean sea lanes was very um, critical to this cultural exchange as well. So we're going to bring heavier, bulkier goods. These are oftentimes carried in large um, bundles or even in barrels. And we could uh, take spices and gold through these dows and junks, these ships that could take heavier and heavier materials. Um, new nautical technologies such as the compass, the familiarity with the monsoon winds, are going to make this long trade, a long distance trade via the Indian Ocean and Mediterranean lanes um, increase uh, by quite a bit. Um, in uh, the long distance trade, some more long distance trade, we have the Trans-Saharan 
uh, caravan routes, which brings West Africa into the global economy. And as we talked a lot about these major three, gold, ivory, salt, and then slaves come from Africa. They travel across the Sahara Desert and they link to Cairo and to um, also to Sub-Saharan Africa. And in here, they'll link to um, Southwest Asia, and from there, they can connect with the Silk Roads. The Hanseatic League cities, these are in Northern Europe, um, and they are going to be really important for connecting Northern Europe, like Norway, Denmark, Sweden, the Scandinavian areas, though, though they didn't necessarily have the borders that they have today, connecting the North Sea and the Baltic Sea into that Mediterranean network, into Asia, and um into the Silk Routes was very important as well. Um, long distance cultural exchanges. Wow, there was a lot. Of course, we have um, the Crusades, which we know uh, gave a lot of interchange between Christians and Muslims. Um, the Sufis, remember, they were important because they had that more spiritual outlook that was attractive to certain people in India and in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, where we have more of the nativist, um, shamanist, diviner religions. And the Sufis are going to bring that that spin to Islam uh, that is going to make that more attractive. John of Monte Cartagena was a very committed Catholic missionary. He actually learned uh, Chinese in a very short period of time. And we'll see later on that the Catholic, especially the Jesuits later on, will become really, really interested in learning the languages of the places that they visited. And in the late 13th century, he did actually go to China uh, by foot. Um, he had very few converts, and in fact, Christian evangelism in Asia has historically been um, not very successful with some, some really um, important examples that we'll look at further on uh, that had actually some catastrophic consequences. Muslim love songs were adopted by the troubadours. Muslims have long been um, oral tradition storytellers, and then the troubadours who went through Europe um, embraced that as well. Um, and then we have long distance exchanges of agriculture and technological diffusion. So um, Muslims brought rice, fruits, and cotton to Sub-Saharan Africa. The fruits will be really important for um, increasing the uh, calorie um, content. Cotton, of course, will be important for weaving. And then the Crusaders brought back sugar to Europe. Now, this is a sugar cane field. These were in the Mediterranean. There were Mediterranean um, uh, plantations actually that grew sugarcane. Now, sugarcane is also grown in South Florida. When I worked in South Florida, they were cane workers. It is very, very difficult work. It's also very dangerous work. And when the United States can, and, and I'm sorry, when Europe connects with um, the Caribbean and the U.S. as well gets involved later on, um, the the Europeans are going to colonize these areas that can grow sugarcane, but they're also going to enslave many thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people working specifically to satisfy that appetite for sugar that that uh, Europeans developed. I mean, think about Europe with their tea and their sugar, a lump of tea. Chinese, uh, a lump of sugar, rather, Chinese tea. You've got uh, Britain really involved in China, really involved in the, Korea, uh, in the Caribbean. As far as science and technology go, the Tang and Song dynasty magnetic compass is really important for um, direction, for ter determining latitude. Lat the Latin sail is more uh, flexible as far as the way that you can turn the ship and the stern rudder, of course, goods to Europe by the 12th century. This is going to revolutionize sailing. It's going to bring the Europeans into the Americas, which is really the next part that we're going to get to. The gunpowder technology that, remember, the Chinese Taoists embedding gunpowder, the Mongolians are going to bring this to Eastern Europe. They're going to start using cannons to breach the walls in Eastern Europe. And by the 14th century, both Europe and China will have cannons that use um, gunpowder. Now, this is actually just a really um, primitive form of sort of a, a ballistic missile, uh, almost like a firework that, that they would light and it would um, fly 
into distance or, or sometimes they'd have like a whole uh, rack of them, like maybe 16 different uh, missiles that will go off at once and could cause some great damage. Now I'm going to segue here to the bubonic plague and we're going to spend a lot more time on this in class, but I would like you to look at the map and see what you notice. If you look at the map closely, you'll see in 1347, there's a band right here. Patient one of the bubonic plague is believed to be in China. Um, the Black Sea is a very active area of sailing and shipping. And it is believed that the Black Plague then spread across uh, the, Black Pl uh, the Black Sea into Constantinople, into um, Thessalonica. And as you see, the colors get lighter and lighter. It is moving further north. People were literally running away from the plague. There are rural uprisings in certain areas. And here in Poland, there are few or no plague outbreaks. And people are like, why is that happening? What's unique to Poland? Hmm, let's think about this and let's see what happens. So the culprits, first of all, are these nasty guys right here. And they go into the fleas. The fleas bite the mice or the rats. The rats go onto ships. And um, so here's what here's what happened what happens then the fleas bite the humans regurgitate the blood into the human wound and the human is infected the disease eventually became airborne it was waterborne they did not understand the process of bacteria and in fact thought that maybe water wells were being um, intentionally uh, poisoned it was actually a horrible thing because it was so deadly. So the symptoms would be what we call boo-boos or the bulbous. This is a bulbous right here. There are modern day cases of the plague that cause these very huge growths, primarily on lymph nodes. Uh, they also cause uh, what we call necrotization of the fingers. Um, so, and they're set once it reaches the septem septicemic form, that means that it is infiltrated the blood system and these vessels are actually dying out and that's why they turn black this was a horrible disease i have no other way to describe it than it was absolutely horrible and almost unfathomable i mean we think about um, what we went through with COVID, and this is so so much worse uh, one of the ways to supposedly treat the black death was let's go ahead and lance the boo-boo so here is someone who is actually taking like a stick and they're trying to pull out the um, infection from the boo-boo of course they had no protective mechanism they had no masks they had nothing to clean themselves and the bacteria would simply spread uh, so that of course was a very uh, uh, un uh, a healthy way to try to treat this pandemic. So what is the course of the pandemic? Um, the Little Ice Age, or what was the cause for it? First of all, the Little Ice Age occurred, occurred in around 1300 CE. We see global temperatures going down. So what happens to crops when global temperatures go down? We have bad harvest. What happens when we have bad harvest? We have famine. What happens when we have famine? People don't eat. They don't get the nutrition that they need and therefore they might become ill the bubonic plague spreads from southwest china we've already talked about the um the spread by the fleas the mongol campaigns will actually contribute greatly to the spread of the bubonic plague and one of the reasons was they catapulted plague-ridden victims over the walls of the cities it was an awful awful strategy but it is a, it was a biological warfare stra strategy so it starts in the chinese interior remember the wan dynasty is in china by 1346 it hits the black sea ports 1347 to 1348 it hits western europe and it has a 60 to 70 percent mortality rate imagine that 60 to 70 percent of people who got sick with it died from it the extreme northern climates india the hub saharan areas 
were unaffected. Um, we don't really know exactly, except that perhaps the weather and the heat somehow killed the bacteria that were, was plaguing Europe. So the global population in millions, we can see um, in the 1300s, um, 1400s has gone down, and then we see recovery beginning in the 1500s. Um, economic and social effects. This is a fairly uh, predictable um, cause and effect here. Um, labor shortage leads, leads to demand for higher wages. So these this feudal system is starting to fall apart, right? These all contracts that people had to stay on land, they're like, okay, well, this other person, they have lost more people they are going to pay me more. Um, in fact, if you're not going to pay me more, I'm going to go somewhere else. And the government says, oh, wait, wait, we don't want that to happen. Let's just freeze wages and stop serfs from leaving the land. But this led to rioting. The serfs wanted their freedom. And, we, and the serfs basically were the farmers on those feudal estates. I don't know if it's a term we've used yet, but it's one that it's that contractual relationship. Socially, the populations were devastated, immorality increased, people had this idea, we might as well live like crazy because we're gonna die tomorrow anyways. And then they look for scapegoats. Who do they look for? Witches. Who are witches? People who are marginalized in society, people who maybe survived the plague. And then they also looked to the Jews. Now, serious pogroms began against the Jews in the 1349, which was really the height of the bubonic plague, in Mainz and Cologne, um, two, uh, they were destroyed. Those cities were just destroyed. Um, in Strasbourg, 2,000 Jews were killed. The picture at the top is a horrifying picture where Jews were placed into a, a hole and um, wood was around them and they were literally burned alive. Here we see the first evidence of Jews having to wear a symbol to denote that they were Jewish. Now originally at first it was thought that the Jewish people had some kind of um, agenda where they were poisoning the water and then people started to think well they why are they surviving they're surviving better and as it turns out they had a lot of cleanliness laws that were making them or helping them to survive but then they eventually would fall to the plague plague just like everyone else so by 1351 nearing the end of the plague we have 60 major and 150 smaller jewish communities that were destroyed more than 350 separate massacres occurred across Germany and Europe. Many Jews fled to Poland and the ones uh, that survived that were in Poland, that's why we see that blue area, uh, they uh, stayed largely free of the plague. Um, but at any rate, we see definitely Jewish persecution on a very large scale occurring at this time. And remember, we also saw the Crusaders sacking Jewish villages and shtetls at that time as well. The result of the plague were um, a, a religious fervor. Now, a lot of people thought, why is God doing this to us? We must be doing something sinful. So people called flagellants were actually people who would whip themselves. They would walk around and on a 33.5 day campaign, one year for each year of Jesus' Jesus's life, they would take whips and they would scourge themselves. That means they would whip themselves two times a day on their back until their backs bled. The whips that they used, they were sort of like what are called nine tails. They had like screws or knots at the end of them that were especially painful. And these were something that they regularly uh, did, like I said, for 33 and a half days. And they would, they might do this um, it, over a, a, a period of time, maybe a few times a year, they were outlawed by the Pope in 1261, but they reached a peak during the plague. Now, to this day, there are people that are called flagellants 
or people that um, believe that they need to cause pain to themselves, sometimes they take a belt with hooks in it and they'll wrap it tightly around their leg until they bleed. Um, this is a rare thing, but it is not unheard of and it has even been shown in some popular movies. I'm going to stop here because recovery begins and I'll get to that at a later time. Uh, but remember, the plague was an awful thing, something we hope to never experience again in this world.